So thanks for everyone for coming. Uh, this session on monetary policy. We have a great panel, uh, and there's certainly enough being created by central banks in the world to keep us talking for the full 60 minutes. Um, we'll have a conversation, uh, and I'll open it up for questions as well. So please, um, you know, incubate your questions, get them ready, uh, and that will make the whole thing more fun and more interesting. So um, up here we've got uh, over there Matt Freund from Calamus Investments. Uh, next to me. Manny Friedman, who has strong views on zoology that he was just explaining to me. Um, <laughs> next to me, uh, Seema Shah. Uh, uh, then we have Bill Lee. And then we have John Taylor. I've conducted some research by background on this panel. And I've concluded that I think it's safe to say that uh, only one of the people on the stage is on the short list to be the next chairman of the Fed. Um, so I'm therefore going to um, direct uh, the first question or two. Uh, to Seema, no, to, to John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to John. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to frame it this way, John. So the, the, the sort of rubric of the panel is um, to do with the central bank's toolkit. Uh, what is left in the toolkit? Should there be more tools in the toolkit? What's your general view on that? So my view right now is we should be looking for ways to put some of the tools back in the toolbox, put it that way. Uh, it doesn't have to be all at once, doesn't have to be rapid, it may take a while to close the box even, but I think that would be good. We've tried many different things. I think there's a craving to normalize in some sense of the word to get back to policies which I think did work quite well in the 80s and 90s certainly, and, and some things have not worked so well recently, and, and some of these things have uh, really expanded the scope of monetary policy in directions which I don't th think is, uh, is wise for an independent agency of government to have as a, as a normal way of doing things. So I'd, be, I'd like to see a, a return. Of course, you never can completely go back. The world is different. It's more integrated. Things are going to be different, and you have to be aware of what happened in the financial crisis, you have to be aware of things like the zero bound, you have to be aware of the international connections, uh, central banks impact each other, certainly. But by and large, I think this normalization, uh, which is what the Fed's term now, seems to be proceeding, uh, makes a lot of sense. So when you say put the tools back in the toolbox, you really mean put them back in the box, you know, bang them shut with a nail, and then throw the whole box into the sea. You, you'd like to... Uh, have them not be used so much? Well, you know, I think there's, a, there's something to be said for having monetary policy be a, a more limited purpose institution, the Fed be a more limited purpose. Uh, there are ways, for example, to use the lender of last resort uh, role of the Fed in ways which have been amended uh, since the financial crisis. Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act is somewhat different, so that's not really putting, certainly don't want to put lender of last resort back in any box is a very important part of monetary policy. There's also, some, at this point, some issues, maybe disagreement about what the impact of the zero bound should be. So I think in the, in the sense of let's make sure everybody understands what's happening before we lock the box. I think it's important to do that. I, my, I would distinguish my view here uh, from sort of the average view. I think there's a sense in which people are worried they saw what happened in the financial crisis. So I'd like to see those issues vetted quite a bit, but ultimately the notion that monetary policy worked quite well for a long time in the 80s and 90s in particular. I think it got off track, started in 2003, 4, and 5, rates were held very low for conditions at that time. It caused some excesses in the housing markets, uh, searching for yield. I think it was one of the factors of why we had such a sharp uh, recession when we did. Of course, there were other things going on as well as that, but that was a factor. So I see some of the harms that have been done by deviating from the policies that worked in the past, and I don't want those to happen again. But it's, it is a call where you have to balance off these various issues. It's certainly not formulaic. It's not rocket science. There's lots of judgment involved. But by and large, having some um, discipline, if you like, on how the instruments are used, I think would be quite healthy. And I think financial markets work, would work better. There'd be less distortions if we had that. 
And I also think the economy would work better. We'd have a, a healthier um, financial system and therefore healthier economy. So there's lots of reasons to do it uh, without going to an extreme where you can never do these things again. So just one more follow-up before I bring in the rest of the panel on this. Just to specify here, the tools which people talk about as maybe having passed their sell-by date or approaching their sell-by date would include um, kind of, you know, putting aside quantitative tools and moving towards a price tool with a federal funds rate, normalizing the balance sheet, that would be a second one, and maybe dialing back on some of the post-crisis regulation. Those are three kinds of ways in which you could imagine going back to the status quo ante. You're, you're saying we should move on all of those. I think, the, I think the quantitative easing certainly should be, you have to reduce the size of the balance sheet in my view, and there's uh, the Fed's beginning to talk about that. I think that's part of getting back to normal where the federal funds rate is determined by the supply of the demand for reserves. That would be part of it. I think in terms of the regulations, uh, I think part of this should be making sure that these excess regulations have not really been a, a negative to certain parts of the economy, certain banks. There's lots of evidence that has, that has been there. So if you can have, say, capital requirements at a level where you can not do all the micromanaging in terms of regulations, they think that would be a better system. I think in a way that's part of the regulatory side of the uh, Fed's activity. We're asking more of the monetary policy side, but on the regulatory side, certainly there's got to be ways to have the system be just as safe without all the micromanaging on the individual regulations. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you want to, do you agree broadly with this idea that we should be going back to a status quo ante? Very much so, and let me expand on a few things that John has just said. Um, it's not By so the way, we, we expect you to disagree violently because uh, the man <laughs> next to you is your former PhD. Supervisor. If I disagree with him too violently, he's going to revolt my PhD, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things that, I, having spent six years at City, um, the academic perspective that, that John has, has just mentioned is something that practitioners worry about because they say, you know, we just can't get rid of these tools. We just can't raise rates. We just can't get rid of the balance sheet and put it back to where it was before too quickly because that'll be financially disruptive. So what the market I think are looking for would be guidelines. How do we normalize policy? How do we normalize the balance sheet? And what tools do we start putting aside first? How do we prioritize normalization? So, so one of the things that, that has guided the Fed in the past has been the dual mandate, maximum employment and price stability, full stop. And so whenever you hear Janet Yellen at the press conference, she says, well, we are this far away from full employment and maximum employment. We're this far away from price stability with the 2% target. And therefore, we're going to gr gradually guide our tools to try to achieve that. The one thing I'd like to introduce into the discussion that John kind of hinted at was market volatility, market stability. The, what have you done to the markets after a bazillion years of, of zero rates? You've distorted them. And so everyone out there in the audience is having a difficult time trying to find alpha, trying to find return. And as a consequence of that, the distortions that have been introduced into the financial markets have to be also unwound. And that consideration seems to be missing in action in the discussion with the Fed. Financial stability and the role of maybe even macroprudential policies, the regulatory toolkit that you just mentioned, is something that we also have to include in the monetary policy discussions on how to normalize. So I think that those are the pieces that I think we can discuss more in terms of finding guidelines, what are appropriate targets uh, th that give you price stability, maximum employment, and financial stability. And, and that's when it gets a little bit more touchy-feely because how do you measure financial stability? And that's where the difficulty of the Fed is. And that's where I think a lot of debate at the FOMC is in terms of how fast do you normalize the balance sheet? Do you even have to normalize the balance sheet? Is, this, is it the absolute number of dollars that you normalize? Or is it the balance sheet as a share of GDP? These are technical discussions, yes, but they really matter a lot. Because if it's the size of the balance sheet relative to GDP, then leave the balance sheet alone and let GDP grow it up. Right? Just let it go away by itself. And, and, and what harm would that do? And that's where the discussion is about, well, you really want to influence the long rate and the short rate and what do you do to the yield curve. Those are discussions that I think go beyond what John mentioned as the ultimate role of the Fed. The, the Fed shouldn't be worried about the slope of the yield curve. It shouldn't be manipulating long rates and short rates. It should be letting the market set these rates appropriately. And its role is to set the policy rate to achieve the goals of price stability, maximum employment, and I say financial stability. Seema, so you um, are an asset allocator now at principal, but you used to work for the Bank of England, I think. Um, so talk a bit about how you see central bank policy in the US or Britain or globally 
um, making life difficult for asset allocators and investment managers? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think the first thing is to, <clears throat> it's very easy at the moment to start thinking about you know, returning to, to, to normal times and to stop thinking about monetary policy now that we have growth. You know, we've got growth in the US, we've got growth in the UK, uh, very complex issues in the UK ahead, um, and of course, growth in Europe and Asia. But the truth is, is that at some point, we are going to be back in this position again. There is going to be another downturn. There are going to be rate cuts coming forward. And given, you know, we've had this long-term decline in interest rates because of productivity, because of um, uh, demographics, et cetera, that that decline means that we're more likely, you know, there's going to be less legroom between central bank rates and the zero rate. So we are going to be back here again. We need to think about what else is in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for, for institutions, for financial institutions, to have a good understanding about maybe what's ahead. So I think that's, that's a very important point. But the other thing is, is it's also important to look at where the economy is. What are the issues? So, for example, in Japan, arguably, it's not the place for central banks to get into. You know, that's not for them to do. They've got structural problems. They need kind of some kind of infrastructure spending. And maybe it's a time to return policy to its rightful owner. Right? Maybe it's a time for fiscal policy to start getting involved. And I think maybe, you know, for, in for institutions, of course, you know, if you think about interest rates and yield curve, you want to know what's going on with fiscal policy. But actually, I think that fiscal policy is, I know we're sitting here talking about monetary policy, but having that, that combination of fiscal policy and monetary policy and how that impacts markets is going to be an important discussion going forward. So just to be clear, you're also saying that you don't think it's wise to assume that extraordinary monetary policy, quantitative easing, and so forth, are things of the past. Do you think that the next downturn will come, will be near the zero lower bound, and these tools may have to come out again? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, the one thing that we've learned in the last uh, few years is, you know, monetary policy with quantitative easing, there were unintended side effects. People, you know, it didn't turn out exactly how people wanted. So maybe quantitative easing is, you know, if we're back here again, it's not quantitative easing we want to do, but maybe there's something else that we need to really start thinking about. And this is the time to think about it when you've got growth and you're not being presented with a disastrous situation. So if, um, let's, let's switch over here to, to Manny. So if, if it would be healthy um, to make fiscal policy part of the toolkit in the next downturn, is that politically practical? I mean, we see all the antics in, in Congress um, around uh, the latest, you know, will they change the 10-year budget window so that they can score a tax cut in a different way and get away with it? I mean, the notion of using such a sort of sausage maker uh, as a device for fine-tuning the macro cycle um, seems a bit of a stretch, or do you take a different view on that? We uh, take a completely different view. There, there is no choice because, in a sense, you have... You know, democracies at time completely paralyzed. We saw that in 08. You know, Congress couldn't function, period. So somebody has to function in a time of crisis. So the Federal Reserve Board functioned, period. They did things that, you know, you know we're, uh, yeah, they looked 100 years back to find the ability to ensure money markets. So of, you're, you're going to have to have a, uh, you know, a policy that is flexible. That's the first most important key. Because I don't care what anybody says here, no one knows what's gonna happen six months now, three months, 12 months. If you lose your flexibility, you're cooked. So I certainly agree with the concept of why have a balance sheet, uh, such aggressive balance sheet, if you have such low rates, you have, you know, the 10 year at two, three today. Okay, so why have a four and a half billion dollar uh, balance sheet. In fact, if you reduce the, the balance sheet, it actually ha gives you a toolkit, it gives you a tool. You're not taking it out of the box. You're, you're, you're getting it ready in case you ever need it again. If, if you take your balance sheet to eight billion or 10 billion, you're soon going to be the whole GDP. So, so you, no, want to, you want to polish There's those no things. reason to have a balance sheet right now with rates where they are. We all agree that zero interest rates are an aberration, at least I hope we agree, because we've never had it in 10,000 years of history. We've had it, you know, World War II in Switzerland. We've had a little aberration in Japan, but 
for ten, eight, for 10,000 years, there is no such thing as zero interest rates. So, how, so that's certainly artificial. Well, zero interest rates mean, you know, you do what your grandmother or your parents taught you. You keep your money in your mattress. You don't make any investments. You simply buy your competitor out. You, you borrow money and make money, period. All these things are, are abnormal behavior that's been created. And I'd say it's more a case of Europe United States, but we're not realistically far away. So it's silly not to have some tools. Now, I completely agree. There are tools that can be used tomorrow morning. And that is the Federal Reserve Board has shown over and over again that it can be flexible. It's already changed the meaning of the word systemic when it comes to mergers. It's already changed the word systemic when it comes to CCAR. So, and they already changed you know, when you have to sell your hedge funds if you're a big bank. But the Federal Reserve Board has said over and over again, look, focus on the five big banks, the five banks that really make a difference. The rest of it's a joke. It's 20, it's 70, 25% of the market. Why are you, why, why are we spending all this time? In fact, we're creating problems because mm -hmm. you, you can't even have cybersecurity with 6,000 banks in the United States. So in terms of using the deregulation piece, that's actually a tool we have right now that should be used unbelievably aggressive. There's $200 billion of excess capital just the United States system alone. That's $2 trillion of loans that, that can be made. So, so there's tools so just, just that Just specify, have, you, how, do you, how do you unlock the $2 trillion in loans you're saying? By opening up that box. So you don't punish someone when they are, they are a little more aggressive in making certain loans. So you, bank regulation is what you're talking about. Yes, but the Federal Reserve Board sets that by setting guidelines. By, remember, you're also dealing in psychology. That's probably the biggest tool that the Federal Reserve Board has is, is just the impact on people's behavior. And mm. we've seen that over and over and over. Again. Matt, I think you share this concern about uh, the impact on small and medium enterprises. Uh, of the way that uh, regulatory policy is configured. Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that um, I think is being talked about here uh, very passionately is the difficulties that the Fed has put uh, borrowers and lenders in in this economy. So you think about what's going on. Uh, uh, small business, the, the small businesses on Main Street are in conflict or are battling some, some of the problems or some of the benefits that you see going to Wall Street and larger firms. So think about low interest rates or, or, or very, ultra, very low interest rates. There are no low interest rates. It's there. low interest rates for a few people. Well, yes, exactly. Everybody else has that's, to go well, to on was, deck and pay 20%, 25%. That's, that's not low interest rates. So rate. that's where I was going. So when you think about um, the carry trade, so if you're in, on Wall Street, you love low interest rates. You can borrow at zero or near zero forever. If you make a profit on that, lever yourself up 7, 10, 15 times, and you're good. Compare that to what's going on for small businesses on Main Street. They're having a lot of difficulty accessing capital. And we've heard in a lot of sessions today, small business are where jobs come from, small business is where innovation comes from, small business is where second chances come from. So I'm very troubled about that. The other thing from the investment side is how difficult these low rates have been. So we were talking earlier uh, in the, the prep room. We, we've changed the way we think about the markets. We used to go out and try to find the best opportunities, the highest yield. Well, yields have really been compressed. So low rates have the unintended consequence of discouraging lending to riskier borrowers. Again, small business, but you can see it across the spectrum. So we spend a lot of our time going out and finding lower risks, or we think the better credits, for about the same yield, because you're not seeing that. You, you, you've seen such a compression. Of there's, there's one thing I don't quite follow here, which perhaps you can clear up, which is that on the one hand, I'm hearing people say, if you're a small business, you pay huge interest rates. On the other hand, you're saying it's not profitable to lend to these companies. That They both can't be true. Uh, no, they both can't be true. So uh, when you think about access to credit, so we have small businesses in the capital markets, and for the most part, these are QCIP securities that, that I deal in. And then you have small businesses that create the majority of jobs. And those are the ones, the non-QCIP issuing companies that are having so much trouble today. 
when once you have accusive, once you're institutional in size, we've seen spread levels really compress between mm. the very best and questionable sorts of risks. Well, it, it was a bifurcated market. There Absolutely. was a market for people who can go and get a loan, and then there's no market. So in Europe, we have a company that does triple net leasing. It does it at 7 8% because they used to be able to go to Deutsche Bank and get their loan. Well, now they have to pay 7 8%. But there's another tool that the, the Fed has or the monetary banks, and that is make the bank safe. Look, look what they're finally doing in Europe. Unicredit, $10 billion. Deutsche Bank, $10 billion. Well, we had top ages ago. What? We had no, no, but these aren't tar. These are, these are making them go to the public market finally after six, seven years. $10 billion, you know, multiply that, you know, that's, that's a huge amount of money. That's a trillion dollars of loans. At least you're make, you're, if you have strong banks, you at least can make a loan. If you don't have a strong bank, you can't make a loan, period. John, one, one tension, I think, in this, in this debate is um, the old one in central banking between discretion and rules. And of course, this goes way back to the gold standard and to the Milton Friedman monetary rule. Um, Friedman, of course, famously wanted to get rid of the central bank and have an office in the treasury, would just have autopilot on the money supply, 4% of year growth. Um, so, um, you know, as, as Seema was saying, you know, we may be back in, a, um, in another recession. We will be back in another recession at some point. And if we're still near the zero, zero lower bound, you know, conventional policy may be constrained. Um, there's a lot of concern on the panel about just the general distortion of capital markets uh, because of a long period of zero rates, which implies that capital markets might blow up. And, you know, who knows what that does to uh, the real economy. So there's plenty of uncertainty out there. Are you really confident that moving back towards a less discretionary environment um, is something that the central bank could live with? I would stress it's going back to a more strategic rules-based environment. Uh, it's, never, it's not rocket science, it's not formulaic, but I think we saw in the past that a, a more regular systematic kind of policy has worked in the U.S., and I'd point to the 80s and 90s until that period of 2003, 4, and 5. And by the way, there was no zero-bound problem in 2003, 4, and 5. They just held that rate very low. There was, it was 1% for a while and, and then was raised very gradually. So that was kind of a deviation from the systematic rules-based policy that worked. I think we see, by comparing different countries, when, there's, when they're more rules-based, systematic, and strategic, I put it that way, things tend to work very much better. The movement towards inflation targeting in emerging markets, I think, was beneficial for that reason. So I would still say that a more systematic policy, it's never going to be purely like a rule. It's always going to be some discretion. I always say you need to have so, some so just uh, as, as, as chairman of the Fed, Chairman Taylor, would not follow the Taylor rule totally. I don't think any, I don't think the Fed should be told what to follow as in terms of a rule. There's a lot of confusion about that. The, there's a bill in, in the U.S. Congress to require the Fed to report its own strategy or its own rule, and that should be the Federal Reserve's job, and there's all different things. I think one thing, one thing that's quite promising in the last few months is uh, Chair Janet Yellen has given speeches where she's compared the Fed's policy to some of these rules. It's very explicit. I think that's healthy. So is the vice chair of the Fed, Stanley Fisher. So that's beneficial. And also, when you're talking about rules, I think it's important to, in the context of tools, it is important to have a, a set of regulations which generate safety and soundness and to enforce those. That's different from moving these up and down depending on the cycle. That's, that's more difficult. And I think you can raise questions about that. But certainly, you want to have a set of regulations and that they're enforced and ensure safety and soundness, whether it's capital requirements or whatever, whatever you have. So I would say tool, so tools, you know, I think getting the balance sheet down to a level, I would say, where the supply and demand for reserves determine the interest rate, and that's how I would define it, is a good idea. It, it, it sort of worked that way in the past quite well. It's really taking that balance sheet tool and, and putting it back, at least for the time being, where it was. I think leaving it high raises questions about being used a lot. Doesn't mean you can't ever use it again, but I think it's that 
we, we found that that policy worked quite well in the past, and I think there's some values to doing that. So, Bill, we'll come to you, but in, in, in my reading of the period before 2007, 2008, I mean, what happened is the Fed cut rates to 1% in the summer of 2003. And then you're right, it just left them there. Um, uh, but it did something else as well, which is that in 2004, uh, it started to use forward guidance for the first time. Uh, and that forward guidance gave the Wall Street the assurances about a sustained low borrowing cost um, so that a carry trade felt less risky because your short borrow in the carry trade uh, was not going to be jacked up against you suddenly as it did in 1994 right. when there was a 75 basis point jump at one point the Fed hiked the federal fund rate. So, Bill, I wonder if you could reflect. One of the tools that we should include in this debate is forward guidance. Yeah. Um, do you think forward guidance, um, which after all was adopted with even greater enthusiasm after 08 because inflation targeting became a, a formal policy, um, do you think forward guidance has been pushed too far? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Actually, I don't think it's been pushed far enough. Okay. And, and I wrote a note when I was at City called forward guidance not ready for prime time. And, and the reason why is because it's missing the a key ingredient, which is what John's talking about, a, a framework that you can use as guidance. Because how do, you, how do you be credible and say, next year, I'm going to be doing the following things. Next year, I expect things to be this, conditioned on what I, my forecast economy is. Unless you have a framework that the market actually believes that you're following. So I want to make sure that we understand, having a rule doesn't mean you don't have discretion. Having a rule doesn't mean that you can't change the rule or get out of the rule if circumstances are unusual or you have a crisis. So having a rule actually has nothing to do with discretion. In fact, I think having a rule gives you more discretion. Having a rule tells the markets, this is how I'm going to operate under normal condition. That's why you can believe my forward guidance, because I'm going to follow this rule. But if we suddenly have a sudden real estate shock that becomes a systemic crisis worldwide, that rule is gone, and I'm going to be using another rule, or I'm going to be playing it by ear until the time when I have figured out what the next rule is supposed to be. So forward guidance is actually a tool that's absolutely incredibly valuable if you're credible. Look at what happened last year when the Fed said forward guidance, right? I expect four rate increases in 2016, and instead you got one. Why? Because suddenly it was China. Suddenly, it was the global crisis and financial meltdown because we are, are in fear of a global recession because manufacturing was crapping out. Suddenly, it was um, one lousy payroll number that came in bad and the Fed opted out. Suddenly, it was Brexit, right? Suddenly, all these things took away the credibility of Ford guns. Now, if you actually had a policy rule that said, I would be raising rates under the following circumstances, right? But I will not hold to that rule if you have exceptions. But if you actually were credible with that rule, four guidance would have worked and, and been able to actually calm the markets so that when they saw China, right, they would ask the, Janet Yellen at the press conference, what is your assessment of China and its systemic consequences for U.S. price stability and full employment? The market doesn't wait for Janet Yellen to tell you not to worry about China or change the forward guidance. It, it adjusts automatically, yeah. period. And because so it didn't know what guidance, Janet Yellen was going to do. Forward guidance, all you're saying is, yeah, give them some forward guidance, but let's be realistic. We don't know what forward guidance is. You're, you just mentioned five, six crises. You don't know what the next 12 are coming tomorrow morning or the next day or, or eight weeks from now, so let's be realistic. Vice when Chairman. you say forward guidance, you're talking about a, a, some guess, and everyone understands it's going to be adjusted based on the fact the world is just keeps changing so quickly. Vice Chairman Stanley Fisher said the central bank should not tell you what it's going to do in the future because it doesn't know what it's going to do in the future. John, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I want to jump in on the forward guidance. And by the way, Sebastian, I think your analysis of 2003, 4, and 5 and, and the role of forward and guidance is correct. And you wrote about it very well in, in your book uh, about Alan Greenspan in a way that demonstrates the problem because not only were rates too low compared to the past, they said they were going to remain too low. So the, in a way, the forward guidance was making people think even for sure it was going to last longer. I would think that forward guidance, in which is consistent with the strategy or with the rule, is fine. It's a, it's a greater degree of clarity. In fact, if, if there's a lot of credibility about the strategy, you don't need to say much about 
about forward guidance. There used to be a lot less talk uh, at the Fed because they sort of knew what the strategy was, and so everybody didn't have to be out there talking about it all the time. Do you want to come in? Yeah, so I, so I totally agree with the idea that if you have a rule and you give guidance relative to that rule, that makes a lot of sense and clearly will be better than what we had. But I worry about a couple unintended consequences. The first one is it's not just what you think is going to happen, but it's the conviction you have behind that. And so I think one of the things that we saw risk departments all over Wall Street do is say, look, we, we know for a fact that uh, liquidity is ample and the rate is zero or very, very low. So, you know, Sally bar the door, we can lever up. So that was the first thing that, that you, you have maybe too much certainty if the, if the guidance is too absolute. The other thing, though, is that we have the balance sheet problem that um, John was talking about. The last thing that you want to do as a trader is say, look, I guarantee you we will be reducing the balance sheet by this much by this date because the street will be more than happy to pre-position the trades up front. So I think with the balance sheet there, um, guidance relative to the rule makes an awful lot of sense, but too much guidance will cause more volatility than I worry that there's very little room for error. Sima. I mean, <clears throat> I actually have a slightly different view to you. I mean, I think that the balance sheet, as you know, if it's going to be normalized, I think they should know, we should know what the end size is going to be. We should know that it's not going to be used in the active tol policy tool as it's getting down to that size as well. So it's a passive runoff. It's very predictable. It's almost going on in the background. And in that way, it can't unsettle markets because, you know, it's, it's just something ticking along in the background. It's something that's just taking us back to the, to the pre-crisis levels. But also, I mean, I, I fully agree that a rule-based policy is better than what we've had in the last decade. I guess my concern is, is that there is, I mean, for example, with a number of rules, a lot of it depends on agreement on the size of the output gap, agreement on what the what the interest rate is, the real interest rate, the equilibrium interest rate, as well as the parameters. So how do we get to that kind of agreement, which is, I mean, there's so much, there's so much disagreement amongst economists on what size everything is. So how do we, how do we deal with that? So I think that's a, that's a serious problem. What is the gap? How do we measure inflation? But I think it's, it's more of a problem if you're not in a rules-based framework. I think the just take, for example, the debate about R star that's going on now, and the Fed, FOMC lowered their estimate of nominal R star from, say, four to three in the last two or three years. But in the context of a policy rule or strategy, you can think, what's the impact of that? You know, but if it helps you understand it, and similarly, there's uncertainty about the capacity in the economy. If you analyze that and discuss it in the context of a strategy, you're better off than just throwing it out there and debating about it. But the, there's no question there's uncertainty about both of those things. And the research that's going on uh, is valuable to figure out what it is. The question is slightly, I mean, linguistic, that if you, if you, I wonder what Bill thinks about this, but if you uh, use the term rule, it sounds like the gold standard, or it sounds like Milton Friedman's automatic 4% growth of money supply every year, and that's it. That, to me, is a rule. Uh, if you're saying it's a guideline, more flexible rule from which you can um, adjust according to incoming information, that I would describe as a framework as opposed to a rule. I mean, is this? Uh, so there's, a, there's a terminology issue. Rule, rule does convey a more technical thing than strategy. I mean, we want to have a strategy for national security policy. It's, we don't have a strategy for all kinds of policies. It makes a lot of sense. When you use the word rule, it sort of is a connotation of something else. But I think there's a, a way to think about the reaction of the instruments as strategic. Say, the interest rate will most likely rise if inflation picks up. It doesn't say the magnitudes, but it's at least a statement about policy. I think it may be able to go further than that, but, but that's the kind of thing that's certainly a strategic statement rather than we'll react to everything under the sun. I want to get to questions in a second, but I want to ask Manny first a question, which is, and maybe more, more than uh, others will want to come in on this, but the politics of the Fed um, is attracting a bit of attention. I mean, the sense that Congress may want to have the option of auditing the Fed or impose other kinds of uh, extra oversight over the Fed, and also that we're moving into uh, the possibility, you know, Chair Yellen's term is up in February next year, um, there'll be several other vacancies. Um, 
uh, there already are some. Um, and so the ability for the administration, for President Trump, to put his stamp on the central bank in a way that's, I can't remember another time in the last quarter of a century where there were that many vacancies that one president can fill. So, you know, while we're talking about stabilizing policy with a rule or a framework or a strategy, there's almost the kind of bigger question of whether the entire institution of the Fed could change in its political underpinnings. We know Congress, look, let's be realistic. You're, we hate to say it, but Congress is like watching a first grade classroom, you know, argue and fight. I think you enjoy and, saying that. What? I think you enjoy saying that. No, it's true. <laughs> and it's not just true of our Congress, it's beginning to be true of other places. What we're learning is there has to be flexibility. And so, so it scares me when I hear, you know, what Congress thinks they, they, they want to do with the Fed. Is that the Fed has been a powerful independent agency. Obviously, the Trump administration has, uh, you know, tremendous number of appointments, it vice chairman of supervision, on and on. Uh, but any, any politicizing the Fed to me is such a disaster because it's been the one ray of hope in terms of governments. Not just here. I mean. Even in Europe, I mean, look, Bank Pesci just went under. If they let it go under an uncontrolled manner, Italy would have been under, period. Italy's not under today because they did it in an orderly manner and they adjusted their rules. So I, the, the biggest argument to make is flexibility because as much as everyone here you know, thinks they can see the future, or, or think what's going to happen, they can. I, I was just with the head of the CFTC. He said, well, I'm watching iron ore uh, and, and, and making sure the prices aren't manipulated. I said, what are you talking about? Iron ore is controlled, the price of iron ore right now, this was six months ago, is controlled by a group of taxi cab drivers in China who talk back and forth, and they've moved the price 100%. And people have to realize how interconnected the world has become. It's much, even though they've, We've accomplished so much since 08, 09, it's really much more dangerous in that sense. And that, that all that argues for is enormous flexibility and certainly not have Congress involved. And you pray and you hope that, you know, Trump has good advisors. Anybody uh, else want to comment on this question, whether, whether the, the Fed's uh, independence could come under political shadow? So I think the, I mean, the Congress has a role. There's the Federal Reserve Act. There's the Constitution has the Congress have a role in monetary policy. That's maybe a little different than other countries. You don't want the Congress to micromanage, that's for sure. So you want to find ways for them to exercise the oversight, which they have, in a way that doesn't micromanage. So I think that's what they're trying to do, uh, and hopefully it will work out that way. I think, actually, if the Fed had a set of principles, this, is, this applies to any government agency actually, a set of principles, it's easier to resist uh, uh, threats to independence. You can say, this is what we're doing. And you got a phone call from somebody who says, this is our strategy. What are you talking about helping this guy? Or it just seems to me it, it's conducive to more independence. And in fact, the, one of the dangers of having a personality-based policy, right? Because we're, everyone's obsessed with, you know, what, who's the chair, who are the members of, of the Federal Reserve Board going to be? In fact, what right now, because so many have out announced they're going to leave, the FOMC character, if you read the minutes, has shifted so that the, the regional Fed presidents have started to have a more dominant role in talking about monetary policy, setting the tone for monetary policy, and the, the voices on the board have been very quiet. And I think th that's a danger, I think, of, of not having a set of principles by which you can say, we know that regardless of the people who are populating the FOMC, they will be following these following principles in setting monetary policy. But because the markets out there need guidance in terms of where will rates likely be go if we had accidents and if we had changes in the, in the setting. No one, Manny, absolutely right, no one can forecast the future. Right? But it's the set of contingencies it's the and how the function. This response function that the Fed has is very critical. And without a set of principles defining that princi th those, those, uh, those responses, you start to get into personalities. And that's when you have not just discretion, you have idiosyncrasy. And you don't want idiosyncratic monetary policy. Seema, outside the US, um, it's been often an explicit contract that the central bank uh, 
is granted independence because the political branch. You mean in China? Uh, I wasn't thinking so much of China. <laughs> I was <laughs> thinking of, uh, of New Zealand, the ECB, the Bank of England, and, and a few others. China's bigger country. Uh, um, that's true. Um, uh, it's probably not part of the you know cutting edge of uh, good practice in central banking there. Um, uh, but but in Britain and in and in New Zealand, which was the first one to do this in 1992, the deal was the politicians say, you know, here's your mission. 2% inflation target, and now go do it. You're like the generals. We've told you which country to invade, but you can figure out how many parachutists you need. So that's been the explicit contract, but in, in some of the countries that have adopted that, Britain is a good example, the central bank has nonetheless come under, I think, more political attack because the mandate has become fuzzy. You know, the 2% inflation target, um, you know, didn't really cover some of the stuff that happened after the 2008 crisis. And then you have a charismatic central bank governor who starts talking about the environment and, and you know, the sort of the, the, the original contract gets blurred. Um, so do you think this is part, this debate we're having about the Fed and the U.S. is part of a bigger global picture? I mean, I, in, in fairness, I don't think it's a new debate. Um, you know, since, since the ECB has been in play, one of the great things about it, I think, is that it's very independent, you know, pretty, apparently the most independent of all the central banks. And yet it has come under continuous pressure from the peripheral countries to have a, you know, maybe a lower inflation target to, to take more account of them, and whereas you know, Germany wants the other side. So this is, I don't think it's a new debate, at least um, the other side of the Atlantic. But what has been, I think, very important and was fascinating to watch, at least in the UK, is the... I mean, Mark Carney, for example, has made some very, very almost aggressive speeches saying, hands off, this is an independent central bank, this is my policy, don't get involved. And he has come under certain criticism. But the truth is that the Bank of England has maintained credibility because of that. And that's what's likely to help them in the future stick to that inflation target. We're likely, you know, we've got this Brexit issue, so we're going to have a couple of years of uh, higher inflation than we want. But on the longer term perspective, once you have that independence, you're going to stick to that inflation target and the market's going to believe it. And that is very important for central banks. Okay. Can I just throw in one Yeah, sure. Point? And then we'll have a question. So, so I'm going to go really quick. So politicians politi politicize. That's what they do. I think, um, you know, they will always be talking about the Fed. I think the problem that's been there forever and will not go away is that the the, sh the benefits are very short term. You can lower rates, you can provide free liquidity, but the unintended consequences take quite, a, we were talking before, take quite a long time to develop. And that sort of tension means you, you have to have a strong central bank to try to look beyond the attention span of the a average politician. Um, anybody got a question? Uh, I've got more if we'd, okay, yes, over here. There might be a microphone kind of coming up behind you at top speed. <laughs> Uh, and then you can say your name and uh, where you're from. Uh, up in the front row. Yeah. Um, well, I'm Shani Mandel Alpha. I'm from the Bank of Israel, which is the Central Bank of Israel. Um, so I wanted to ask, we're seeing for quite a lot of time that the interest rates are close to zero, though we don't see the rise in investments. I mean, we were expecting to a much major volume of that. So we're 10 years from the crisis, and then we don't see a rise. Why do you think is the origin of that phenomenon? And what do you think that needs Why to be Why should I invest if I can buy you for nothing? If I can buy you for minus two, minus three, in, in Europe, minus five. Are you, no, it's still you, a fair question. No, still, no, that's not true. It's still a fair question. You can borrow very cheaply, so you might want to go and build a factory. And that's well, well, why should I build a factory when I could get a higher return buying her or buying him <laughs> or buying this yeah, person? But, I don't need to buy. I don't need to build okay, a factory. Okay. So that, that's, that's, that's one view from the front. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, yeah, Bill. Let, let me restate Manny's view, perhaps, <laughs> in a slightly less uh, uh, colloquial language. Uh, <laughs> uh, if, if, if I told you, right, that I have zero rates, essentially it says cost of capital zero, right? But if you went out and actually bought a new machine, right, and said, here's a new machine, your, your, your board would say to you, what are you, nuts? You've got five machines sitting there doing nothing. You have the nerve to get another machine? Where, where are you thinking? Do you have any pricing power that you can pay the loan back? Do you have any prospect that your, your, your sales will be accelerating in the future? Are you anywhere close to producing capacity. Right now, nobody's got pricing power. Nobody is, 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 is uh, looking at sales accelerating. And, and no one, right, is able to, to I'm talking about buying a competitor. 
but that's just it. So instead, what are you doing with the money? Dividends, stock buybacks. You're giving it to shareholder-friendly actions. So, so, so essentially, 60 cents on every dollar of the S&P 500 companies have been going back to dividends, so, stock so, buybacks, what you're, what you're and not CapEx. Is there's basically inadequate demand. That if there was more demand, then companies would create more capacity. And lower rates have not spurred that demand. Yeah, but I asked Isn't that the place for fiscal policy then to come in? And I mean, I honestly, I think that... Infrastructure plan. Yeah, for Huge. example, infrastructure yeah. plans. You know, since Trump came in, there's a reason why the equity market has performed as it has. It's because of this hope, I mean, definitely hope, of fiscal policy. You know, that's what's, that's what's pushed equity markets. Everyone knows that, you know, as you're saying, monetary policy has not yet achieved what it was meant to achieve. And it's time to maybe look somewhere else. So, so ac Matt, yeah. Or, or ac go, go, yeah, go ahead. Access to capital is part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that the <laughs> offered returns from that capital investment are justified by the risk, or the risks are justified by the offered returns. So if you're worried about your energy policy, your health care policy, the Chinese, uh, the, the fact that you can borrow cheaply is just one of those equa uh, one of those variables. But I completely agree with Bill, the intersection are stock buybacks, and that's why I think we've seen an awful lot of activity there. There is also, I want to get John's view, but there's also the possibility, I think, and this might resonate with somebody from Israel, because you have a very strong tech and innovation uh, sector, is that the cost of doing lots of new types of capital investment has fallen massively. Obviously, that's true in software, um, but also I'm, I've just spent a week in Silicon Valley. It seems to be true in lots of other tech sectors, even nuclear fusion, where the you know the cost of setting up a lab to test your fusion device has fallen by, on one measure, somebody told me last week, a hundred times in the last ten or fifteen years. So the demand for capital um, has uh, reduced because the cost of getting yourself established in a world of Amazon Web Services and so forth, you don't need to buy a server, has come down. So for at least a sector of the, of the economy, uh, th this appears to be a factor that John and I do. I don't have too much to add except the, the zero and even the negative rates. I think there, there are distortions that are caused by those. It's hard for banks to pass through those negative rates. And in addition, I think for small open economies uh, like Israel, there's a contagion of the policies, and it, it, it forces central banks to do other, to bring out these other tools to help the housing market or to counteract the, the bubble that's causing by the low rates because you, 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 you don't want your exchange rate to appreciate so much. But so there's an enormous contagion of policies around the world, and I think all the special things that the Bank of Israel did in the last several years are, are related to that. Do we have another question? Yes, over there. Yeah. Hey there, Rockwell Shaw. I'd love to actually hear what the panelists think about what were the great successes and failures of the Fed's actions in the 2008 crisis? Who wants to take that? So I think the uh, lender of last resort activity that the Fed undertook uh, when things really got bad in the, in the fall of 2008, uh, that the balance sheet did increase at that point. Those liquidity operations, I think, made sense. The liquidity facilities, of course, drew off very quickly out that, and then the Fed did their quantitative easing, large-scale asset purchases, which I question their impact. And I also have to say, since the, the crisis itself was preceded by some problematic things that I've referred to already, the search for yield, the low rates, and I think the, the uncertain action, first with respect to Bear Stearns, that well, what happened to Bear Stearns, and the confusion about Lehman, I think that added uh, uncertainty. So those that uh, ad hoc uh, policy, I think, was problematic. But the lender last resort, and including the swaps to other central banks um, at that time, I think, uh, made a lot of sense. Do you think it was a mistake to broker the rescue of uh, Best Ends then? Is that what you were saying? You know, if you go, I, it's, it wasn't in the room. As I said, I wasn't in the room, uh, so it's very hard to say. And I have, I have been in experiences like this, as you know. So it's hard to say. I think in retrospect, if that once that operation had been done, I think there should have been very clear why and under what circumstances it would happen again. But I think the dialogue that followed after that was we had to do this to save the world, to save education, to save anything under the sun. So there was an expectation that it would happen again. And when Lehman came and it didn't happen again, it was a big surprise. So, so without questioning the Bear Stearns, which I can't really because it was a surprise, it wasn't there, I think certainly question the fact that there was no description of what the policy was right after. So no consistency as between Bear and then Lehman. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on? Yeah, I think the Fed did a, a brilliant job because I don't think people have a complete sense of how close the system came to collapse. When you have any system and it goes to the very edge of chaos, it can spin out of control. And we came within a day or two. If Morgan Stanley would have gone under that Monday, then 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 Goldman was under on Wednesday, period. And 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 because financial systems are completely based on trust, if you lose that trust, it's finished with. If everybody in this room believes JP Morgan is finished, I don't care what Jamie Dimon does, they are finished, period. So it's a self fulfilling prophecy. And the Fed by cutting it off and in a sense creating you know, they put up programs, or everybody put up programs of probably 25 trillion on a GDP of 16 trillion. You ended it fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. In Europe, they didn't end it. And it's still going on today. Okay. Another question? I can see one uh, in the back there, or oh, halfway to the back. Uh, so, Ed Han from Milken Institute, and my question is, what, what do you think is the implication of, like, central bank independency on the swap lines between the five, the top five central banks in future? And... Uh, Why do you ask um, about independence with relation to the swap lines? Why, why is independence the key thing? Because I'm wondering that, like, if central bank loses independence in the next financial crisis, whether Fed can provide those you know, um, unlimited sway. I see. Sway I see. Lines. That's a good question. Okay. Okay. So I guess that, that in some sense, if the politicians have more sway over the Fed, the Fed will feel more nationalistic yep. and less inclined to help other countries, as we've seen with, um, in fact, is, you know, analogizing to the. 1990s and the emerging market crises, Congress <coughs> did prevent uh, or make it difficult for, that, that's the right way to put it, um, administrations from helping Mexico and so forth in 95. But John, you've, you've been in the Treasury during crises in Argentina. Right. Um, what do you think? So a couple of things. I think the swap lines, is a rash, there was a rationale for them. It was basically for, for dollar markets uh, to provide some lender of last resort to the other financial institutions. And I think one discussion now is whether the IMF should be also thinking about that too, because it is quite limited with only five. What, the, what is India going to do, for example? So that's a, that's a legitimate question when there's so much dollar lending out there around the world. I do think the emerging market example that Sebastian mentions is very important here, because there was an effort uh, when the crises were, were so strong in the late 90s and, and early parts of this century to put some uh, rules uh, or, or framework on the IMF and its lending. So it was not supposed to lend to a country whose debt was unsustainable. So that was like a, uh, that was like a strategy. And it actually, I think it did improve things for quite a while. It, 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 it was possible because they have these, uh, these special clauses in the bonds so that you didn't have to have a, a, a very um, traumatic default in these circumstances. So I think that worked quite well. It actually fell apart in 2010 with the loan to Greece where the Fed violated its own framework, but since then it's, uh, it's revised the, the framework. The Fed or the IMF? I think it's better shape. With the IMF. Did yeah. I say IMF? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 IMF, yeah. IMF here with respect to Greece, yeah. But, and it may be relevant to the question that, um, I think I'm right, that um, Adam Lerick, who was in the debates about um, helping other countries in the 1990s and took, was on the side of those who said that too much in the way of bailout assistance was a mistake, is now in the Treasury, I think, or has been nominated to a position, right? So, so uh, Adam Lerick is, I think it's intention to nominate the, as Assistant Secretary for International yeah. Affairs, and David Malpass is the Under Secretary of mm. International Affairs. So they'll see what, we'll see what they do. Yeah. Um, they're good people, in my view. Maybe one more question. There's one here, yes. Microphone in the front. Thanks. Thank you. Max Gockman from uh, Newport Beach. Um, so let's say in two years from now, we have a fairly bloated fiscal budget. We haven't been able to raise rates quite enough because we've had these uh, pseudo-crises. 
However, the dollar is still fairly high, and we haven't been able to reduce the balance sheet that much. What does the Fed do? By assuming we now have overheated the economy and are about to uh, go into a recession. So this is Seema's uh, scenario, right, where we have another recession, um, but the classic tools of fiscal policy, monetary policy, balance sheet use have already been used a lot. What happens then? I mean, it's a very good question. It's a frightening question. It's a realistic question. <laughs> Absolutely. I think mean, that's very fair to say. Like, I think most of, what we've seen from the central banks in the last few years is that they have been very innovative. Um, you know, they still you know, talk about increasing the inflation target to try and avoid hitting the zero lower bound. There's stuff like targeting long-term interest rates in the way that the Bank of Japan has done, which, you know, it has its own issues but potentially could help. So, you know, from what, what we know of and what we can introduce, there's nothing which seems particularly effective and groundbreaking. And, you know, maybe this is a slight cop-out, but I have full trust. <laughs> the central bank is to come up with something fantastic. And um, I mean, I guess, you know, the one thing that everyone would point to is helicopter money, you know, the infamous helicopter money. Um, can you're, I, you're just bringing in a whole, you're opening a can of worms if you do that. But, you know, if that's an emergency situation, maybe, maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a measure of the debate that there are people who are generally described as serious uh, <laughs> who nonetheless make the argument that the end game here is that the central bank buys a lot of the government's debt and burns it. And, since, and the argument goes, which I think is fallacious, but the argument goes that because the central bank can print money, it can print money, buy the debt, and then just destroy the debt, and then, hey presto. I think there's a problem with that argument, but it is a sign of the desperation that creeps in when you ask about this scenario. I don't know whether, so, bit, or, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, markets have been shown to be the, the best, not perfect, but the best way of clearing imbalances if they're allowed to work. And I think part of the, the problem is, is that we're, we're so sure that we have to do something and not let the markets do their job of allocating capital and, and adjustments. That's the first point. I think the, the second point, though, is that, you know, I think we're going to have an advantage because we're going to be able to look at what's happening in Japan and in Europe. Because I do feel that they're closer to the edge than we are, and hopefully we will, we will learn some lessons from how they respond to what I think is two decades of low growth. Well, that's a rather depressing statement, because <laughs> the Japanese don't seem to have got out of the problem, right, which exactly. began okay. circa 1994. Right, a couple so decades ago. It, <laughs> can, I, yeah. can I ask a slightly different spin? Because I think that was a trick question. Uh, and here's the trick, because you said, Here's a disaster scenario, right? The debt is going skyrocketing. Um, the, the, the deficit is, is spinning out of control. And, and the economy is going to recession. And we're facing inflation. Now, that doesn't quite mix, right? Because that sounds to me like someone really screwed up on fiscal policy. Because how on earth did we get into that situation? Because the, the, right, the, the, the right kind of response to a good fiscal policy would have been the economy started to pick up. Right? We started to increase productivity because all the infrastructure spending actually kicked in and we actually had better productivity. Uh, and that would not have raised inflation. So, so if, if the scenario is, the one that you're talking about really is serious, I would look immediately at who screwed up fiscal policy. What went wrong there? And let's correct that first and not resort to a, a, a monetary policy placing another distortion in there to try to correct what was already distorted by fiscal policy. B Bill is courageously asserting here that a question premised on bad fiscal policy is totally unrealistic. Uh, <laughs> uh, Seema, yeah, no, it's fixable by using fiscal policy. It's completely realistic. <laughs> Seema, go ahead. Okay, so I'm, yeah, I'm guessing this is probably the last comment that we're going to have. And given that technology has been a key part of the whole topic at Milken, I think it's worth talking about very briefly this idea about having a digital currency because certainly in the Bank of England it has become one of the core parts of the current agenda in the Bank of England. They are dedicating a lot of research to it, to the idea of moving from paper currency to entire digital currency. So everything is in electronic form. You no longer have cash in your wallets. Right? So, and the reason this has taken off in recent years is because of Bitcoin and the blockchain technology. Um, now, I'm definitely not a tech, tech guru whatsoever. So I can't go into the, the depths of it. But the key point about that is that once you have everything in electronic format, you are able to put a zero interest rate, sorry, a negative interest rate on currency. Okay, so then there is no zero lower bound. And I think for a number of reasons about, you know, I referred to before what I, I think that zero lower bound could be hit again in the future. 
um, a lot of central banks are dedicating time to that idea so that in the future, if this happens again, at least we have one other tool. I don't know how effective it would be, but it's certainly something that central banks are spending a lot of time thinking about. And not just the Bank of England, but the Russian Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, um, the Federal Reserve I know has looked into it, although I don't think they're as keen as the Bank of England. But it's certainly um, a topic which the central banks are and may, just for looking into and maybe a topic for this panel next year. Yeah. Uh, digital <laughs> currencies. Anyway, thank you all for coming. That's it. Thanks to the panelists.